Okay, so uh, today I'll give you some more, I'll really go more into uh, structure formation. And I will, uh, what I will do here is that I'll solve the simple situation uh, that's when you have basically matter perturbations and the evolution of matter perturbations. If you have something more complicated than this, then it becomes quickly very uh, in access, uh, inaccessible to analytical calculations. But, uh, but matter perturbations are really important. They tell us something very, very deep about why we are here in the universe now at this moment. And this we can do, and this is what I'll do today. Um, so I'll give you some background about what we're doing here. So this is, um, this is a simulation using only dark matter particles. Uh, and oh yeah, I forgot to turn this on. I'm not going to restart what I was saying. Anyway, so, <laughs> so this is, uh, hello? Yes. OK, so, uh, so th this, these are initial conditions which are consistent with what you see on the CMB, the same statistical distribution of matter perturbations. And then you just evolve this with the, let's say, general relativity equations. Actually, they are. Uh, um, um, there are more sophisticated versions of the Newtonian uh, physics, but basically you can think of this as being general relativity. And as, as you see in time, the regions which were initially denser, here, for instance, you can see a denser region that gets denser and denser and denser and denser and eventually becomes a really dense region. And other under-dense regions like this one here, which were already under-dense here, they also become much more under dense in the future. So this growth of structure, that means it's like inequality, income inequality. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. This is what, the, this is what gravity does. So this happens at a certain pace, right? And we are going to calculate that pace here today. But there are many, many more aspects to the uh, distribution of large stru scale structure. There's these initial conditions. There is the effect of radiation or dark energy and so on. And we're going to have to look at this from different angles. So we have to keep in mind that we are going to attack this problem from different angles, complementary angles here. OK? Uh, so this is how you could see that, that uh, those initial perturbations grow. So this is a movie that I've, done, that I've done myself here. It's completely trivial. You start with some initial conditions here. And then you grow these perturbations. And you see that there is something really strange happening here, which you wouldn't expect, at least in the beginning, in what we call the linear perturbation regime. Linear perturbation The linear regime is when this delta is much smaller than 1. In this linear regime, you see that the shape of that profile in density doesn't change. And we will show you the equations that tell you that this is not changing. In 2D, this will be something like this. And in 3D, you can't really visualize so well, but that's basically it. We know that these initial fluctuations in density were of order 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, up there at a redshift of 1,000. So we can evolve them in time. And for at least a f uh, the first few millions, hundreds of millions of years, this is a very good approximation. Uh, of course, this becomes a poor approximation once this delta here becomes of order 1. You cannot do this anymore. Then the equations have to be, uh, you, you, have, you cannot use linear equations anymore. You have to use the full nonlinear equations. And this is then the time when you stop doing anything like this and you say, OK, I'm going to just going to do a simulation or some other technique. Uh, if you do a simulation, this is the kind of thing that you expect. This is redshift, so time is moving forward here. This is a scale that you can see here, 50 megaparsecs. So you see that a redshift around 10, the universe is still, uh, was still uh, homogeneous at that, uh, those scales. But at redshift 3, you can already see that there are uh, a lot of inhomogeneities. And you see that as matter falls into the gravitational wells of the overdense regions, this process becomes radical. And, here, of course, on scales of 50 megaparsecs, the universe today is very inhomogeneous. You really have to go to scales of hundreds of megaparsecs so that you can see this on average. Then on average, this is kind of a homogeneous picture. 
So this, of course, we cannot solve analytically. But in the beginning, we can. And this is what we're going to do here. Uh, notice also that the initial conditions there, they'll tell us something about how matter started in the, in the, uh, at the first moment there. And this also has information about physics. We cannot forget. So um, we are going to be looking at this in many different aspects. Of course, also have to remember, and this will be very clear in the later uh, parts of this course, that we don't observe dark matter, uh, which is the dominant massive uh, code component of the universe. Directly, we don't observe dark matter. We observe what? We observe tracers of the density. So galaxies. And galaxies are not all the same. They don't really relate to that underlying density field in the same way. That is something that very often theoretical cosmologists forget. Galaxies are not all the same. They don't reflect the underlying density field in the same way. And this you really have to know. If you want to do precision cosmology with large scale structure, you have to take into account the fact that different types of galaxies are, they tell you something different about the density field. And this is where cosmology meets astronomy and the field of galaxy evolution. And then if you really want to do precision cosmology, you have to, uh, if you hate uh, these, uh, let's say, gastrophysical things and astronomical arena, then this is not for you. You have to understand how galaxies form and how they behave and how they relate to the, to the density field. Otherwise, you cannot do this game. Uh, OK, so what are we going to do in the end? What are we going to measure? We don't care about one galaxy individually, or one galaxy here or there, where it is. We care about where galaxies are with respect to each other, so we can make something like a correlation function. Correlation function tells us two things. It tells us, first, what were the initial conditions for the universe. Okay, So what was this field like in the first moment? What were the processes that created that? Okay, so that's inflation, that's the recombination physics of the radiation and baryons at the early universe and so on. And also how this evolves with time, how the correlation function evolves with time, that tells us something about the regime of growth of structure, how structure evolves with time. And this is some, these two things we're going to do here, okay? Uh, so we can do this in, in real space and in Fourier space, like I said before. And I'm going to go now to observe, so I'm not going to tell you a lot about this, uh, this initial shape. I will come back to this uh, later in this class here, especially to describe to you how you get this feature here, the so-called baryon acoustic oscillation feature. But for now, what I'm going to describe to you is how this field evolves initially with time in the linear regime. Uh, okay, so uh, to the blackboard now. I'm going to get rid of this for a second here, okay? Uh, and I'm going to come back here. And so, um, correlation function. I want to give you, so if, you, if you're not familiar with this, it's a good idea to have a first notion of this, right? So, uh, suppose, so here is what we're going to do. We have a density field here. So this is kind of a density field that you expect. You have some peaks, some troughs, some underdense, some overdense regions. And we have to understand how they evolve with time. I'm, I'll come to these equations in a, in a moment. So we describe this in terms of some average, some mean, and some fluctuations. So this is, these are large fluctuations here. OK, guys? If, we, if, you expect, if, you, if you measure this initial density field in some initial moment, you would see something like this. You would almost not be able to see this here, OK? You may be able to see a blip here or a blip there, or something like this. But initially, this was very small. So at a redshift of 10 to the, uh, at, a, at a redshift of 1,000 and above 1,000, these were order 10 to the minus 4, OK? They were basically constant on most of the scales that you care about uh, before that time, and then this process of structure formation growth starts to happen later in the universe. Uh, I'll derive an equation, equations here that tell you exactly how this is happening, OK? Uh, but so you start from this, and then you evolve into that. Now, we will find equations for this density contrast
which we call delta, okay? Uh, which is a delta rho over rho, so it's the fractional over density or under density. So this is a picture of this delta here. And we care about the correlation function of this delta. So what is the correlation function after all? If you have never seen this or you don't, you want to develop, start developing an intuition, here are two examples. So I want you to think in your head what sh you should expect for the correlation function of this function f here. So I build this correlation function. This is one dimension, okay? So what do you expect this to be? Let's say that this typical distance between these peaks that I have in here, this is of order some scale, let's call this R0, okay? So what do you expect the correlation function for this function f here to be in this first example here? Can anybody tell me what I should expect? Exactly. So let me put R0 here. And I don't know really what's going to happen here, but it should have something like this. That's it, right? Because it's very likely that once you get a peak somewhere at a distance r to the left or to the right, you're going to get another peak at a, dis at a typical time uh, distance of r0. And if this distance is exactly r0, then you might have a peak which is very pronounced here, right? So correlations, so if you, it's very likely that you find a peak near each other, OK? Two peaks near each other at a distance r0. What about this case here? What is the correlation function now? Exactly, a negative. Because if, I, if you find a peak anywhere, you're going to find an anti-peak nearby, to the left or to the right, doesn't matter. So it's the same thing here, r0. But now you don't know what's happening here. And then you're going to find something like this. OK? So positive correlation means that you find the same thing nearby or within, within that distance. Negative correlation means that you change the signal. If you find a positive, that function is positive somewhere, then that distance, that function will be negative. So what if I tell you now that the correlation function of the density field, which I'm not going to, we usually just use this. We don't use delta here, OK? But what if I tell you that the correlation function is to a good approximation something like this, OK? It has some features on top of this, but if I tell you this, what should I take from, uh, from this statement now? Now that you develop some kind of intuition about the correlation function, what should, I, what should I, you understand from that? Sorry? Exactly. So if you find a positive peak somewhere, it's very likely that nearby you find another po positive peak. It's also positive, that function. And if you come closer, it's even more likely. So there's a correlation length here. So you need to really step out something like this much so that you don't have correlations between the densities in different regions. So there's a correlation length here some, somehow. OK? So this is some correlation length here. Now, if you go after that, then you find a negative correlation. And in fact, if you're talking about delta, something like delta, which is a function whose mean, right? mean of delta, of course, the mean of delta, and that's not only under linear regime, it's always the mean of delta is zero, right? Because we're talking about the deviation of something from the mean, so the mean is zero of that deviation, right? So always when you talk about something like a correlation function of something called something like delta, it has to be the case that if you have a positive thing here, you must have a neg negative thing there. You understand why? Because you have to balance all the positives with some negative. Overall, when you integrate over the volume, this has to be 0. So if you have a correlation here, if things are negative nearby, they have to become positive somewhere else, or and vice versa. So they are either both negative and then negative positive, or either both positive and then positive negatives. You have to balance out. So in some sense, this always has to go like this. And there's a sort of a, there's a constraint for the correlation function here. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but now you will see there is a, there's a meaning to this, right? So how do you express this now in terms of, um, of the correlation function in Fourier space? And this is a bit harder to see, but if you think a bit more about this, you'll see that it has to be the case. So this is k. So actually, this is a log 
log plot, okay? And this figure is something like this, okay? So this is the Fourier transform of this. And it turns out that this is something that goes like this, okay? It's, let's say that this is enshrined in, this, in these kinds of expressions, and this tells us um, something about the, um, uh, both initial conditions and how matter behaves. Now, let me go one step further and ask you what happens. You saw the picture of how this, these initial uh, conditions evolve with time, right? How they grow, how this goes up, how this goes down, this is going up, this is going up, this is going up, this is going down, and so on, right? Suppose that we have initially, at some initial time, suppose that we have this correlation function here, and suppose that we evolve the density field linearly with that growth that I told you about, what do you expect that's going to happen with the correlation function as these uh, density fluctuations become larger? What do you expect is going to happen? Sorry? Th this function here? Well, if you wait an infinite time, maybe something like this, but <laughs> just let's say that we are still in the linear regime and so on. What's going to happen? Yeah, just any gas is good at this time. More pronounced. Yeah. Exactly. Because if delta is growing, then delta square is growing, and psi is basically delta square. So it's really going like this, right? It's really going like this, and like that. OK? Basically, that's what's going to happen. So how this is happening now, right? This is telling us how these guys are varying with time. And this tells us how fast structure is growing in the universe. OK? And this is what we're going to derive now. Yes, question there. Yeah, usually when we say here, we say co-moving coordinates, OK? Right? So this, is, this, this point is kind of fixed here. Although, of course, that is only a statement in the linear regime, where the deltas are not being uh, distorted in the nonlinear regime, this could move a little bit, right? You still have to have the condition that for, if you have a, a bunch of positive things here, you're going to have a negative thing there. By the way, there's an interpretation of a correlation function in terms of the probability of finding uh, that function somewhere or another, but I don't have time to go through this. But this is well described in many of the textbooks. By the way, if you have this now, what's going to happen here in terms of the power spectrum is something which is simpler, actually, to see. Because the same movement that enhances the amplitudes here will enhance the amplitude here. So with time, the amplitude of the power spectrum grows. Of course, it has to happen, because you can imagine that if the amplitude of these fluctuations are growing, then the amplitudes of all the modes that describe these fluctuations must also be growing. And these modes square the amplitude of those modes, which is exactly the power spectrum, right? The power spectrum is basically, basically this square. These, the amplitude of those guys has to be growing, because the fluctuations are growing, right? So in some sense, this is even easier to see. So the more you wait, the stronger your power spectrum is, OK? And of course, what we want to do is that we want to measure not only the shape of this power spectrum, but also how it changes with time. And in the linear regime, this change is basically, it preserves the shape of this power spectrum, OK? All right? So let me, I'm starting to. Sweat over here. So, any questions? And uh, as I take some layers off here. No, no, no. It's okay. Uh, well, if you want me to turn on the AC because it's hot for you guys. Or? No, for me it's fine. I mean, if I just take my shirt off, it's better. Okay. So now what we're going to do is that we're going to. We're going to derive some equations for the perturbations, OK? Yes? Yes. 
Yes, I, I won't have time to go into this, but uh, yes. Um, but it's, cosmic variance is very simple to see in the power spectrum, but very hard to see in the uh, correlation function. Um, can we answer this in the discussion sec yeah. section? I think it's going to be, because this is a bit more technical. Let's say cosmic variance here is something that affects large scales, which are clearer in here. They affect uh, the, the correlation function in much more uh, non-trivial ways. Because the correlation function, the covariance of the correlation function is totally messed up. It's all over the place, whereas the covariance of the power spectrum is not. It's diagonal in K. That's, uh, sorry for the technical answer, but that's, that's the, we can, we can come back to this. So, all right. So let's now compute how this guy here behaves with time. Let me leave that on the blackboard. And we are going to be assuming that perturbations here are small. However, not only when we want to find equations for this, for the fluid of whatever you have in the universe, for matter, for everything that you have there, all the components, you cannot just assume that you have density. You have to include other, other um, other features to your fluid also. So let's start about the perturbation equations. Okay? And there are two ways of deriving these perturbations equations. There's the hard way and the easy way, which is a kind of a swindle. The hard way is to go back to the Einstein's equations and do basically something like this. You get your density, which is a function of x and t, and you describe that in terms of some homogeneous background density plus those perturbations of x and t. Now, this is homogeneous background. These are the perturbations. Now, you cannot only do this for energy density. You have to do for everything that describes uh, the, that fluid. And that means also that you have some pressure. So you have pressure perturbations. Pressure has a homogeneous component. And it has also some perturbations of the pressure. And finally, and most importantly, the velocity of the fluid, which is again affect this kind of thing here, is described by a background quantity and a perturbation. Now, the background, we already know what it has to be, although you haven't done this explicitly. But the background is just, just basically the Hubble law, the Hubble flow. And this is basically age of t times r. So if you take any reference point, the physical distance from you to any, any other point in the universe is growing with a Hubble parameter here, if the universe is expanding. And we perturb this. I will not write a delta here, because it's, not, it's just a convention of the area. We write here v. okay. And this is also a function of x and t. I, I'll, I'll stop writing these x, x and t's here. And this, is, this v is what we call this peculiar velocity. And this is the Hubble flow. Ah, I hate this. <laughs> I cannot write with these things. Uh, they have some other thing here. No. Anyway, OK? So of course, the metric of space-time is also perturbed. And in order to account, it, account that, take that into account, you have to go back to the Einstein's equations and perturb the Einstein's equations and take it forward. And if you're interested in how you do this systematically in the right way, you take a look at Mukhanov's paper or Patrick Peter and Philip Uzan's paper, uh, not paper, books. It's well done there. I don't like the way it's done in Doddleson, but it's there also in some limit, in some sense. So also, you can take a look at that. But that's how you do it. I'm not going to do it here, because it's too much work. It would demand several lectures you know, of uh, perturbations in homogeneous and isotropic spacetimes, which is a bit too much for these lectures. Uh, and then we have to plug this. So we, you remember that, basically, the metric perturbations they come through, for instance, g0, 0, which is 1 minus 1 plus 2 phi. 
and this is the Newtonian potential, right? This is what this is how you get at the you get the let's say Newton's second law from the, the geodetic equations, right? So basically, it's that idea. We instead of looking at the all the richness of the metric perturbations, we are only going to take care of the Newtonian potential here. This is a good approximation for small scales in the universe, especially during the matter-dominated area, but it's not a good approximation if you're talking about doing this anytime. Of course, every time you see some of these more sophisticated simulations or the um, results from, uh, from the CMB and the CMB codes, everything is done properly there with all the metric perturbations and the really the relativistic equations. But here I'm going to take a limit, let's say the limit of cold dark matter and uh, small scales, okay? So everything that I'm doing here, it's proper, it's okay for doing evolution of large scale structure for most of the story of the universe that we care about here, all right? Okay, so what are the equations after all? What are the proper equations? And they are, and you'll see that you recognize them from other, as we say in Brazil, other carnivals, right? <laughs> Each carnival is a different fantasy, so, you know, so first it's the continuity equation. Continuity, which we can write in terms of all these partial derivatives. So these are all partial derivatives, okay? Plus divergence of rho times u. So that's for a fluid. So that's basically continuity equation for a fluid. Then you have the Euler equation, okay? And that is a bit more complicated. It's an equation for uh, the velocity or the acceleration, if you want. So that's sec Newton's second law for fluids. And that involves the velocity of the fluid, involves the pressure gradient, and involves, of course, any external force, which in this case is the gravitational force, which is here, OK? Now, you'll notice that the continuity equation doesn't have really pressure, but notice that pressure comes through the divergence of u, OK? So the divergence of u involves a term like pressure, so this gets back into here. So it's really there. Of course, if you do the relativistic equations, this is slightly corrected. You have a bit more complicated equations. But in the non-relativistic re regime, they, they come down to this. OK? Yes? No. So this is it's a very important question. I was going to uh, say this right next. So this is physical. Remember, these are the fluid equation, equations. So these are the physical distances. This is all physical here. This is also physical velocity here, OK? This is very important, because I'm writing equations as you recognize them for fluids. So these are physical coordinates, not co-moving coordinates. Co-moving coordinates are introduced once you put a metric, and you find that it's, of course, much better to express the uh, friedman robertson walker metric in, ter in terms of these co-moving coordinates. So uh, these equations are initially physical. Of course, then you have the equation that relates how the gravitational potential is determined by the, by the matter, and this is just a Poisson equation, which if you, if you, if you uh, if we include the relativistic matter here, at least pressure, this is, so the pressure, uh, so this is total pressure and density. And I'm just going to put a c square here, even though I'm not going to carry that c square later. So just so that you, just, just so that we are clear here, um, if the fluids don't have a direct, if those, if you have, for instance, two fluids, baryons and dark matter, if they don't interact at all, if they don't have some kind of a direct channel of interaction, then this, for each component i. It's like this for each component, OK? But this is the rho total. OK? Everything gets into here, of course. All matter, you have to take into account all matter in order to calculate the gravitational potential, OK? All right, so these are the equations. And this is what we're going to do now. Um, but we have to do it carefully. So the, the end game here is to write an equation for this delta here, 
which is a function, of course, of x and t, right? I was find, I want to find an equation for that delta, starting from here and making this kind of expansion here. So this is called a perturbative expansion. We say that this is very small, much smaller than that. We say that this is much smaller than that, and this is also much smaller than that. OK? So we're going to do perturbations here. And of course, we only can do perturbations if really, if they are small. Once we go into the nonlinear regime, the equations start to fail, and they're not really telling us much about the system anymore. So on very small scales, these equations don't hold anymore, because on very small scales, the matter has already fallen into the deep gravitational wells of some initial over density, and then delta is bigger than 1. OK? This doesn't happen so quickly on large scales, because it takes a, lot of, a long time, billions of years, for matter to fall all the way from outside into a, let's say, a um, galaxy cluster. OK? All right. So how do we do this? Before we do this, let's realize that we have written equations here, which are really, so this is, so this is the nabla with respect to physical, uh, physical uh, distances. And what we want, we, we know that it's much more intuitive and it's more clear if we write things in terms of co-moving coordinates. Now, how do we go now about doing this? Because these are partial derivatives with respect to some physical distance. And we want to transform this into, let's say, co-moving. Distance and so on. Well, we know that r is equal to a of t times x, right? And we can use this now to try to rewrite these equations. Now, you have to, be, you have to do this, this carefully. Uh, and you have to take into account all these partial derivatives here. So um, let's start with the time derivative in these coordinates here. So when we say time derivative keeping r fixed, OK, and we want to write this in terms now of a system where we have this and that. And also we have, let's say, this is called, let me just put some, uh, some uh, some indexes here, just to be, I'll, I'll get rid of them later, but remember that time doesn't change here, because of course, ds square is equal to minus c square dt square plus a square of t dx square, right? So this time is the same as physical time in that sense, so this doesn't change, but the distance changes. So what should we do here? This is really, what you have to do is I have to, have to take the partial derivative of this, um, uh, of this time here, of the two times here, at r fixed. And then you have to take d, d, t, c at x fixed. And then there's another component here, which is d, x co-moving d, t physical at r fixed. d, well, I should really write then gradient co-moving at t c fixed. So this is how you, for instance, write the time derivative, the partial time deriv derivative as you go from r p t p to x co-moving t co-moving. Okay. This is what you have to do. Of course, this is one here. This is one. This is d d t, but this is not. Now, what is dx co-moving dt at r fixed? OK, well, let's write x co-moving as 1 over a times r, physical. And then dx co-moving dt, because t is the same, at r fixed is just taking the derivative here, because we're keeping this guy fixed. And now this is just minus a dot over a square times uh, times uh, rp. And this is just minus h times x co-moving. That's an important feature here. So this is basically, so this, when we write d dt in the initial physical system, this is going to be d dt in the co-moving system, OK? 
And then there will be a correction term here, which is minus age x c dot nabla of the commoving coordinates. Let me see if I didn't make any mistakes. No, it's that. All right, so all these time derivatives here that's, that are happening here and there, you have to introduce a term like that. Now, for the other one, uh, for the other one, we basically have to do the same. You can do this uh, as an exercise, but it's basically the same idea. Okay, so I'll leave it for you as an exercise. There, are, there, is, there is actually a, a non-negligible cancellation that's going to happen. Um, anyway, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. let's see here. If I didn't miss anything, linearizing, blah, blah, blah. I, do, I took a, a different path than I did here. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, no, the other one is the same, sorry. Uh, basically, um, sorry, this one is trivial. The nabla r, so it's d dr, right? r you can write as a times x, so this is 1 over a times this. This is trivial because there's no time derivative that's going to appear in there. Okay, so... Um, now what we have to do is that we have, have to go back to these equations here, we have to use this, that, and that, substituting here, 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 with this change and that change, okay? And I've done it some, you can do this in any order that you want. <laughs> It's not going to make it much easier. You always have to, um, you always have to, uh, uh, to do things uh, properly. But let's do this in a, let's do an exercise here just to, just to get this started here. So let's get the equation here for, um, what is this one here? Uh, what did I write in here that I can't? Okay, okay. All right, I'm going to let me see which order I do this. It starts to get, um, these things, they start to get messy very soon, so, okay, so I'm going to do for the density in Euler equation, and this guy here, um, okay, so, Okay, um, I'm not going to go through this whole derivation here. I think it's not a good idea in here for me to start doing this because it's, um, I may easily get, uh, get confused one way or the other, and this is a kind of a trivial step, uh, but it's kind of algebra, doing algebra here for you in front of you. I don't think this is, this is very useful for you to, to do that. So uh, what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to jump into the... Uh, into what the result is and leave this for you to figure out how you get there. I'm going to be cruel with you and I'm going to leave you to you this. Um, okay, so first of all, um, first of all, let, let's see, let's do, let's just give one example of how, of how you can do this. Um, let's look at the background for this guy here. That's, that's an easy first step here. So let's look at the terms when we say that all these are negligible. So we have only row bar, p bar, and h. 
And let's substitute that in here and in, well, in here to start with, OK? So these are the zeroth, what we call zeroth order continuity equation, OK? Just to see that you're retrieving something that you're familiar with. So I, this, I think, I should do. Uh, first of all, you find that this, you have a term that's coming from here, right? Uh, so uh, this is, this, by the way, I, I'm, this calculation that I'm going to do, I'm, I'll, I'll still be using uh, the, uh, this uh, definition here. Uh, so let's see what happens when you use this in here. What happens here if you have d rho bar dt plus gradient of uh, rho bar times u, where here u is only coming from this term here. OK, so this term here, the Hubble flow, OK? So this is really here just age times r. Of course, this is only a function of this is only a function of time. Okay? This is a function of time. Okay, so this will be rho dot. Then this jumps out of this guy here. So rho so rho dot bar plus rho bar, and then you have divergence of h times r. Remember that this is r here, right? Now, what is this term going to be looking like? Because this is not hitting r again. You can, sorry, not hitting h again. You can pull the h outside of this. So this becomes So let me remind you that this is this guy. Now, what is this? This is 3. So this is just rho plus 3h rho equals to 0, which is what you remember from the continuity equations for, um, for the background. And here, there is no difference because the time is the same time. We have no uh, space derivatives that are left here. And this is all that you have. So this is basically what you have. And remember that here, this means that in some sense, your pressure has to be small here. OK? The only way that you can get pressure back into these equations is that if you have some velocity here, which has, through the Euler equation, you have some pressure. You can get back some, uh, some pressure here in these equations through, for instance, some, uh, uh, some term in the Euler equation. So in principle, these equations they are going to describe matter perturbations. Now, I can allow for some pressure perturbations to be there but not for overall pressure, OK? So this is one of the limits of these equations. And this is also telling you that these equations describe the evolution of matter perturbations in the universe, but not if you include a general fluid, which is important. So if you have an important component of, say, radiation, then these equations are perhaps not ideal. Then you have something missing there, OK? OK, so what you have to do now is you have to substitute this into these equations. You have to change the time derivatives. And then you have to open this up, and then I'll you guys can do this um, later on. There's a bit of algebra, which I'm not, uh, not I don't think I want to spend the time to do this, because I want to have time to show you the feature of BEOs, et cetera. So let's go to these equations and try to solve them. So all right, so. So uh, expanding the fluid equations and using the background equations, the background, that means zeroth order solutions 
you find the following three equations, which is what we're going to use here. We find that, first of all, you find that the continuity equation for delta becomes very simple. Now, I'm, I'm using co-moving coordinates here. So this plus divergence 1 over a divergence of v equals to 0. That's the continuity equation for delta. OK, so that's delta rho over rho. So I've already done many steps here, right? So I have substituted this here. I have substituted rho bar into this equation. I have eliminated some terms. I come back to this. The other equation that we have here for the velocity field, there are many constellations that happen here, especially for the velocity field. So ddt plus hv equals to minus gradient, oh, sorry, there's a minus 1 over a gradient of delta p over rho bar minus 1 over a gradient x of phi. And then finally, that's the least easy to see, but when you look at this, you have to be careful, and this is kind of a slight swindle that we do, that what's, what is the gravitational potential that, uh, that, you, that you should be computing here? Is it for all the matter? So is it like a Newtonian type calculation where you include all of the matter of the universe and the gravitational potential from anywhere that you are? Even in a homogeneous and isotropic universe, it grows, right? Or is it that in a homogeneous and isotropic universe, there is no gravitational field? No, nobody is going anywhere. There's no gravitational field because there's no preferred place that you're, you're going to be attracted to, right? The universe is homogeneous. Where would you be attracted to go? Uh, so the only thing that really gets into here is that really should be the, the, the pressure, the density and pressure fluctuations. It's a deviation from the homogeneous. So that thing gets really the, the way to interpret this is that we really have to consider here only the perturbations. The universe doesn't have a preferred, uh, for the homogeneous and isotropic component, you're not, your field, your gravitational field doesn't pull you anywhere in particular, so there's a kind of an overall underlying gravitational field which is a kind of an artifact. Okay, so what you get from, uh, from the Poisson equation using rho bar and p bar here is kind of an artifact, it doesn't matter. It's the only, the only component that really matters are the perturbations here. So it's 4 pi g, so it's 4 pi g, delta rho total plus 3 delta p total over c squared. So these are the equations that we have to solve now. And now they are also in moving coordinates, which is very convenient. And then, um, and, this is, and this is what we want to do. Now, it's complicated, of course, because these are three equations. They are all coupled, right? This is coupled to that one through v. This one is coupled to that one through phi. And phi is determined by uh, delta rho. Of course, you look at this and you say, well, these are linear equations. They are linear equations in delta rho, delta p, and phi, right? So since they are linear equations and, they, and you have stuff like gradients and Laplacians and so on, of course, what we're going to do eventually is go into Fourier space. Uh, I don't need to do this right now, but eventually that's what we're going to do. Linear equations, that's what... We, that's uh, the most basic trick, trick you have in the book, and this is what we're going to try to do later. Um, and it's often useful to come back to Fourier space, but I'll, I'll not need, I don't need to do this right now. Um, OK, so what do we do now? OK, so one way, of, uh, one way that you can uh, imagine that you can, by the way, let, let me now lose the, this x from here, OK? All right, so this is all, it's, it's assumed that I'm using co-moving coordinates everywhere, okay? 
so one of the things that we can do is that instead of having an equation for delta and one equation for v, we can combine these two equations here, right? We can, for instance, take um, the time derivative of this, right? And we can combine with the divergence of, of this, okay? And we can combine them to eliminate the to, to eliminate v. It's actually a bit more, a bit less trivial than it looks, but that's basically what we can do. Okay. So if we now combine these two equations, what we get by combining these two equations is that we get an equation which is I'm going to write like this. So a dot, a dot is partial derivative with respect to time. And then you have this delta double dot plus 2h delta dot is equal to uh, Laplace and 1 over a square, Laplace of delta p over rho bar plus 1 over a square Laplace of phi. Okay, so that's, uh, of course, you still have to use the Poisson equation here, right, in order to find what phi is, but now we have an equation for delta. The only thing here that you notice is that now we don't have just delta here, the density contrast, but we also have delta p here. So this is something that happens all the time. We have to make some assumption about, we have to say something about what kind of matter we have, what kind of pressure you have in your matter. So what is delta p? Exactly, right? Uh, what is delta P? What is pressure? How can we relate, actually, for instance, delta P with delta rho? Now, you've done this probably in thermodynamics or statistical mechanics or even solid state physics. What we can do many times is that we can relate the variation of pressure to some variation of density under some assumption. For instance, you can say that the entropy is conserved here. And then it turns out that for pretty much everything that we know about that we use, that this quantity is, is something that is basically a constant or something that is well described by some simple physics. And this is what we call the sound speed or the adiabatic sound speed, okay? So we are, let's say, entitled to just say, okay, uh, whatever pressure I have from either some component there, which is a, a small amount of radiation or something else, maybe your matter has a, is slightly hot, let's say, then you might have a small uh, pressure component, and I can describe this through some adiabatic uh, sound speed. And... Um, Okay, so now we can use this, we can come back here. Now, of course, you can have that delta P over rho bar, that becomes just Cs square delta rho over rho bar, which is Cs square times delta. And then we can put this back in here, and now we have an equation that we can pretty much solve. By the way, we can also put it in here. Let's say that we have a single component now, we can also put in the Poisson equation. And now, finally, we're able to solve for an equation, a second order differential equation. Okay? So, right, so you put it in here, you put it in there, okay? Um, you write, uh, rewrite the Poisson equation as 4 pi g rho bar. And then this, this becomes delta plus 3 cs square delta, right? That's an easy trick that you can do. And now you plug this back into here, and you finally have an equation that we're going to consider here. This is also called the genes equation. And this equation is this. 
delta double dot plus two h delta dot is equal to, uh, here I'm going to, now in Fourier space, I'm going to use Fourier space now because it's clearer to use, Fourier space, uh, and then your Laplacians become basically minus k square, right? k, of course, is co-moving, huh? because it's the inverse of a co-moving scale. So k is co-moving. Don't, don't, don't forget that it's kind of tricky if you ever have to con convert uh, k physical to k co-moving or vice versa. It's the opposite way as distances, OK? So it's, instead of being a factor of a, it's a factor of 1 over a. Anyway, um, so this equation is, turns out to be basically this minus k square over a square, cs square delta. Then you have another term, which is coming from the Poisson equation here, which is, um, oh, by the way, I, there was a mistake here. This is a, there was a 1 over a missing in this. OK, sorry, there was a 1 over a. Uh, missing there. I copied wrong here. I forgot about that. So this guy becomes 4 pi g rho bar delta times 1 plus 3 cs square. By the way, I also had a it says 3 cs square here. I forgot to say that there was a c square factor and a c square factor here, but I'm using taking c to 1. OK, for radiation, for instance, just, just a second. For radiation, for, uh, for instance, if you have a small amount of radiation, you can have uh, Cs square is equal to 1 third. By the way, if you have radiation, exactly you have 1 third. But here, you can allow that you have a small component. Yes? Why are you considering that this process of uh, is, reverse, is reversible? Is reversible? Yes, because why am I considering that it has constant entropy? Yes. Ah, okay, that's a very good question. The point is whether or not you can assume that this is an equilibrium. The same thing, right? So, uh, the question is whether or not you have production of entropy, really, in this uh, happening here. And then you have to come up with a way in which you have to describe not only, let's say, mechanically like I'm doing here, you have to look at the fluids and you have to see what kind of interactions you have, a Boltzmann equation for them, and see if there is production of, of entropy. And uh, there are no significant processes which produce entropy in the sense that we, you're talking. We're talking here, remember, we're not talking about necessarily a thermodynamical system here. It's a mechanical system now, OK? So this CS square, I only use this trick here so that I can assign some sort of a pressure to a system. Now, uh, for most of what I'm doing, for basically everything that I'm doing here, this is, can be regarded as a system of billiard balls, OK? Now, there is a pressure component, and for the pressure component, you must think thermodynamically. And that's why you're asking this, right? So for whatever fluid that you have, you have to be sure that this, this is not happening. For basically all the process that we see that we that at the scales that we care about, there is no significant production of entropy up until very late in the universe. There is product production of entropy later on, for instance, when you start forming stars and galaxies, and then you, and then you convert the, both gravitational energy and nuclear binding energy into radiation that you pump back into, into the universe. So in that case, it's not conserved. But this is a tiny component. And in fact, this is very complicated to include into these, into these simulations that people do uh, when they include baryons, for instance. Okay? But for everything else, there's no process that we know that, this is, that, is, uh, that produces entropy. Now, I'm not assuming that it's time reversible or not. This is a mechanical system. It's not a, it, it, the equation is just, these are just mechanical equations. So you know, it's, uh, the question is not, it's not in the same context as you would ask for a thermodynamical system. Right? It's a mechanical system. I don't understand the difference. I mean, you're Reversibil Irreversibility is a question about thermodynamics. Scheme. It's not about mechanics. Doesn't, if you're talking about a mechanical system, the equations are reversible. 
The yes, question of our reversibility is about the entropy, right? Yes, but you're, you're treating it in large scale, so it is thermodynamic. Uh, why? Right? It's a system of, think of dark matter as a bunch of billiard balls in the universe. It's a mechanical system. You can think of it thermodynamically if you wish, but the equations are these, and they are time reversible. If, suppose that, at least suppose that if the pressure is zero, for instance, okay? Suppose that pressure is zero, which is, by the way, a good approximation. This is the equation. This is like F equals to MA. It's, re it's time re reversible. Yes, so, but uh, time revers reversibility in microscopic equations not always imply Oh, on large scales, these are non-microscopic equations. We're describing things on large scales. On very small scales, then, of course, you may, all hell may break, break loose. But if these equations can be regarded on any scales which are significant for cosmology, then these are time re reversible. So either you're choosing large scales which are totally a mechanical system, or small scales where other stuff happens. Either one, but you cannot have both. I mean, which one are you asking the question then? I don't know, I have to think about it. Yeah. But it's, the equations here at this level, they are, let's say, just like mechanical equations. So the question about irre irreverse, oh, this is a hard word, irreversibility is just, as you would ask for, I don't know, a harmonic oscillator or anything like this. Okay, so a nonlinear system, on the other hand, it's a different matter. <laughs> nonlinear systems, you have all kind of chaos and what, 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 what not, and I'm not going in there, right? So uh, for linear equations, this is all time reversible, and these are completely, let's say, uh, canonical type solutions, and we can use the canonical techniques. It's true that I'm using some sort of a, I'm, I'm considering some sort of a pressure, and I use thermodynamical arguments, and you have to be careful about this. But as long as nothing radical is happening at some moment there, and you have to check, then, it's, uh, then this is a good approximation. Um, there are many instances where we do see a production of entropy and things are, are irre irreversible in the universe, okay? So uh, in the big era of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, in the um, near recombination, there are many processes which are irreversible, okay? Um, and then they have to take them into account, and they are taken into account in the Boltzmann codes that people use to evolve the CMB. It's just that this is much more complicated than just uh, these equations here, which are much, much simpler in that sense, okay? Where am I? Here. OK. So OK, I still have about half an hour, which is all that I need here. So this, this is the genes equation here. Describes to us how a uh, matter system evolves under the influence of gravity, which we already included here, by the way. OK, so this is gravity here. OK. Uh, and then we can ask what happens with an overdensity of any sort here. In fact, you know, this is here. Basically, this Laplacian here, right? It's appearing there. So we can even look at this at, uh, from, uh, uh, from the point of view of the physical equations in, 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 in coordinates, in usual coordinates, in, in configuration space, right? OK. So. Let's try some solutions to this genes equations. Okay? Okay? So example of one solution to the genes equation is when you see when you consider only cold matter. And that means cold dark matter or cold baryons or whatever. And then you have this is zero. By the way, this is the usual uh, usual situation that we are going to see. Not always, but this is like the most basic thing that we can do here. Um, so uh, we can consider this to be small uh, in this case here. So um, what is going to happen here? Uh, we're going to have an equation which is like this. 2H delta is equal to 4 pi G rho bar delta. OK, so this is delta for cold matter. Now remember that uh, 8 pi g rho, bat, rho matter is equal to 3 h squared. That's the freedom equation here, right? Um, let's say that the universe is flat. Take the simple case of flatness. Um, this is what you have here for a mat for, for freedom equation. In fact, uh, 
you can now say that this is, you can go one step further and say that for a matter dominated universe, you remember how A of T behaves with time. You remember this? For matter dominated universe, where rho goes like a to the minus 3, right? Where equation of state is 0. By the way, equation of state and this sound speed, they are kind of related, but they're not really the same thing. OK, so remember what this is? t to the 2 thirds. If you don't remember, just plug this back in here, a to the minus 3 in there, solve this equation here. It's a really simple equation to solve, OK? Now, if this is true, then age is just a dot over a, and it's 2 over 3t, OK? And then this equation becomes delta double dot plus 2 times 2 over 3t times delta minus then 4 pi g rho bar, right? is equal to 3 halves of h squared. So this is now 3 halves of h squared times delta. So that's 2 over 3t, right? So if I'm not, oh, it's square. Delta equals to 0, correct? I miss anything? No. OK, so let's see. So that's delta double dot plus 4 over 3t delta dot minus 3 cancel, 2 cancel, 2 over 3t square delta equals to 0. This is the equation here that we have for matter perturbations. OK? How do we solve for this? I'm sure that many of you have done this. So those that, you have no, that know this, please, not fair. Don't say anything now. But if you haven't done this before, how do you think this can be solved? This is the first time derivative. This is second time derivative. There's a factor of t here. There's a factor of t squared here. You know how to solve this? It could be that everyone here knows how to solve this, and I'm just. Uh, Who knows how to solve this? Please raise your hand. So not everybody. OK, good. So I'm teaching you something new, at least. How do you think I can do this? Let's do some dimensional analysis. A second time derivative means that you have 1 over t squared times delta here. One time derivative, that's 1 over t, but you also have a t here. And this doesn't have a time derivative, but you have two factors of t here. So each time you have a derivative, you, you fall 1t down. This, you fall 1 over t squared here, 1 over t here, and you already have a t squared there. So what is a good ansatz here? A polynomial, right? So try solution t, say, I don't know, some alpha. Then you have that here, try it here. Then you have the equation here, alpha, alpha minus 1, plus 4 thirds of alpha minus 2 thirds of alpha, oh, sorry, minus 2 thirds equals to 0, right? OK? So now you have, you can solve this. So that's uh, alpha square minus, uh, so minus, uh, sorry, plus 1 third alpha minus 2 thirds equals to 0. So that's just a part of just, so alpha is minus 1 third plus or minus 1 ninth. Um, plus 4 times 2 thirds over 2, right? If I do recall this well, so this is uh, 9. Uh, so this is uh, what's going to happen here. So this is 3. Let's see. Am, am I doing this right? So, my, so it's minus 1 third plus or minus this is... Uh, Sorry, why did I put this 1 over 9 here? It, oh, yeah, it's 1 over 9, 4. 
So this is uh, here, this is, so this is 1 ninth plus uh, 8 times 3 over 9, and this is uh, 24 plus 125, so this is 5 over 3. So this is minus 1 third plus or minus 5 over 3, divide by 2. So the two solutions are minus 1 plus 5 thirds, that's 4 thirds, sorry, uh, yeah, so minus 1 plus or minus uh, plus 5 thirds, is that it? That's, yeah. Uh, I did make some mistake here. <laughs> I should have something different here. No, 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 that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> of course, it's fine, it's correct. Minus 1 plus 5 thirds, that's 4 thirds, so that's 2 thirds. And the other one is minus 1 is minus 6, that's minus 2, minus 1, right? Is it? Sorry, I'm kind of slow. All right, so delta has two solutions, of course, because it's a second order equation. One goes like t to the 2 thirds, and other goes like t to the minus 1. Now, t to the 2 thirds is also a of t for the matter dominated regime. So this is telling us that, of course, if you have any kind of initial condition, you have a component both here and there, but this one, right, this one grows like the scale factor, and this one decays. So this is the dominant solution. Let's say dominant or growing mode. And whatever initial conditions you have at any time, usually you're already dominated by the growing mode. OK? So all that you have to consider is really the growing mode. Uh, so now, important result. So for matter domination and linear regime, delta goes like the scale factor. Now that's really something that you can stop and think a little bit about. Because if the matter perturbations grow like the scale factor, then you can think the following here. Um, suppose that the initial density fluctuations were of order 10 to the minus 4. That's at a redshift of 1,000. OK, so let me erase this here. Suppose that the, the initial, so let me say this is log a, OK? All right, so let's say here that log A, log 10 of A, to be even simpler. And here is, let's say, 1,000. That's the time when the CMB was formed. And let me write this log delta here. Let me make this plot here, OK? So we know that uh, delta is of order 10 to the minus 4 around here. So this point would be here, so that's log 10 delta, so that's minus 4, OK? And then we know that delta and A, they are proportional. So if delta goes with A, so what's happening here is that this is, uh, time is going that way, right? So delta is growing this way. Uh, minus 4. It's going up. It's, yeah, as A becomes smaller, this becomes. Uh, sorry. This is not. This is redshift here. <laughs> I, mean, I thought about redshift and I wrote A. <laughs> let's see, log A here. And this is, let's see, uh, let me make this plot again. I'm going to make this, the same plot here, but really in A. It's a redshift. So this is a, this is minus 3, right? Because that's log 10 of a. And this is log 10 delta. And this is minus, <laughs> my axes are all wrong. Uh, Ah, 
I know, I'm insisting on something completely trivial and stupid, but... Okay, so minus 3 is over here. And, and at this moment, you have minus 4 here. So you start over here, right? So that's when... Uh, that's the CMB. We know about 10 to the minus 4. Really, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, it doesn't matter. And then it grows with the scale factor here, right? So that now, so this is minus 3, and this is 0 here. About now, in the age of the universe, is when we expect the perturbations to be of order 1. It really took a factor of expansion of order 1,000 to get initial fluctuations, which were very small, and grow them to be at least of order 1. It actually doesn't happen quite like that, because if you really think that the linear regime extrapolates perfectly, then even today, you wouldn't have structures. You would still have fluctuations of at most over one, order 1, maybe order 0 0.1 or so. But the point is exactly that the linear regime fails and fails quickly, especially on small scales. Okay, on small scales, this delta becomes larger than one very quickly. And then the process is, in, is not a power law anymore. It becomes basically nearly an exponential. And in fact, you can get something like that from the Gene's equations. Uh, you can see from the Gene's equations here that if you look at small scales, you can basically disregard this kind of term here, disregard that term, and you get some sort of an exponential solution, okay? So the, the reason and the explanation for us being able to be here, basically now, from the initial conditions of the universe was that we really had to wait millions and millions of years, a factor of, thousand, of order a thousand of expansion, such that you could, from homogeneous universe, which had nothing, just a soup of particles, to create stars, planets, galaxies, and so on, right? So we are not here now by chance. We really had to wait tens, hundreds of millions of years for structure in the universe to form. Otherwise, there would be nothing, OK? Um, all right, so I have some more discussions here that I wanted to go over, but I'll, I, I can probably leave them as, as exercises for you since my, I'm, I don't want to kill your time again, and I still want to do uh, I still want to look at uh, some of the other features here. So, bottom line here, okay? So let me just write this in this board here. In the linear regime, we have the delta of matter goes like the scale factor. And therefore, in the linear regime, both the correlation function goes like a square, and the power spectrum also, they grow like a square, okay? Of course, as you enrich the physics, this will become more subtle. If you change something in the physics, if you change some components, if you put some pressure here or there, if you put some other thing, if you put dark energy, by the way, I'll leave you as an exercise to show that when the universe starts to become dominated by dark energy, this doesn't happen anymore, okay? Fluctuations start to become frozen, and you will see that this you can show basically using the equations that we have here, okay? And I'll, sh I'll, I'll, I'll make an exercise that you can work out yourself, OK? So dark energy also freezes the uh, process of structure formation on large scales. Uh, this all I'll leave for you in exercises, OK? So the growth of structure, what we mean by growth of structure, by the evolution of large-scale structure, is in its simplest example just this, that, and that, OK? And if you want to have something else, some other model, some other physics that you want to test, you want to solve equations which are pretty much like these equations here, and answer what happens with delta. Now, there's another thing here which is also very important, which I didn't comment on, but look at this equation here. There's something here that happened as I played around here, perhaps we haven't noticed, but here, here, and there, these are equations which involved also spatial derivatives. Still there. Once I substitute the Poisson equation, of course, this you can take away, but there's also this term here, which if I assume that, 
this is zero, no spatial derivatives. So, just to be clear, this solution here tells us that if you have delta of x and t, in terms of delta of x and some t initial, this is just a of t over a of t initial. OK? The shape of your perturbation doesn't change. The shape doesn't change. There's nothing that, so the only thing that can change the shape is if you have some part of the system talking to the other part through spatial derivatives. But you don't have any here in this case, because the pressure is the only thing that does it for you. If you have no pressure, the only thing that's moving matter is the gravity. But gravity, if it is really described just by an equation like this, then there's nothing. By the way, this is only happening for matter in the small scale regime. If you look at large scales, relativistic uh, effects and so on, this doesn't happen anymore because you don't have just here the gravitational potential in this way. You have gravitational potential without derivatives happening here and also pieces of the gravitational potential here. So this already doesn't happen on, on, on large scales. But on very large scales, I should say, scales of the order of the horizon, OK? So if you want to describe structure formation on extremely large scales, you need relativistic equations. However, it turns out that these are very small corrections. So what we're doing here is pretty much, it's pretty good, OK? All right. So this about sums it up for the evolution of structure. However, before we go on, I should tell you about something about, uh, so just to summarize, I told you how basically, I basically told you at which rate we have both the correlation function becoming stronger or the power spectrum becoming larger, right? I told you how this is happening with time, okay? But I haven't told you anything about these shapes here and if you recall, there was a strange feature in those shapes that comes actually from the initial conditions. It comes from, well, I shouldn't say the initial conditions, but it comes from the physics of, ra uh, of radiation and baryons and dark matter together during the epoch when you're also forming the uh, large scale, uh, the cosmic microwave background. And this is already imprinted there in some sense. So I want to tell you about the different part now of this story, which is how this uh, shape is imprinted there in the beginning. So, this is a very, like I told you, you, you have to see this from different angles, and I'm just going to give you one of these angles now, okay? Uh, all right. So, I'll have a brief review of you to you, and this is not to substitute in any way uh, what Cora is going to tell you, or Merdad also in terms of the, so Merdad is going to tell you about the very primeval, primordial initial conditions. Cora is then going to tell you how those get processed by the physics of baryons and radiation and dark matter doing recombination and decoupling. But I'm interested in here in how that is translated in the end to some initial conditions for the matter fluctuations that we then evolve, at least initially, with the equation that I described here to you. Okay? But that initial shape, this is what I'm going to stress out to you here. Okay? So. What I want to tell you is how you get this scale, which is called, called the Baryon Acoustic Oscillation Scale here, right? So just a brief review of uh, how, we are, how we get the, to see the CMB and so on. So this is a very a cartoon of the evolution of the universe from our point of view, looking back in time. There's redshift here, time there, energy there. In the initial, system, in the initial, in, uh, initial times, we didn't have e even any nuclei. This is Big Bang nucleosynthesis here. But even after that time, we didn't have any neutral atoms. We had only ionized hydrogen, helium, free electrons, and radiation, which is here seen in green. And as you saw from Cora's lectures, uh, you were only going to be able to form and keep neutral atoms after uh, near, uh, an age of about 380,000 years at a redshift of about 1,000, when the energy scale was about half an electron volt. Now, question to you guys. You know why this energy scale has to be half electron volt? Isn't the 
binding energy of the hydrogen atoms 13.6 electron volts. Why is it that we need to get all the way down to 0.5 electron volts for you to really have the formation of neutral atoms? Do you remember this? Why is it? Why do we have to go so low? Why isn't it the case that as we go down to, I don't know, five electron volts, why aren't we able already to, to form a bunch of neutral atoms and the universe to start to become um, neutral at that time? Do you remember this or not? Sorry? Exactly. There are like a, a, there's like a billion photons for each baryon universe. And if you look at a Planck distribution, even with a billion photons, you have a few of them which have high energy, energy which are high enough to ionize that atom back again. So you really need to lower that energy a lot so that you have basically zero photons which are ionizing energies. Okay? All right. So after that happens, then you are able to form the neutral atoms. The universe becomes neutral and becomes also transparent. And radiation then scatters for the last time in something there. And then the ones that happen to be moving in our way, we get to see them later, 13.8 billion years later. Okay, so that's how you form the CMB. So the physics that's going on here, for my lectures and for Rogério's lectures, what, all we care about is this initial conditions pretty much over here after this has all happened. Okay, so we're going to describe how structure forms from that initial condition there. So what do we care about that physics? You saw yesterday from Kora's lecture that you have this thing called the Saha equation that tells you how you reionize the universe. So this is basically the ionization fraction here that you have. So this is what you get from the Saha equation. This is what you get from a more sophisticated approach here by solving some equations, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you can imagine that this gets uh, complicated really fast. Now, what this means is that if you look at the free electron fraction here, and if you look at what we call the visibility function, that's, so that's the likelihood that the CMB photon that you see now scattered for the last time at some redshift, okay? So that's the function here. You can show that this is the case here. It's a, good, it's a simple argument, but here is the visibility function. So what's the likelihood that the photon of the CMB that you see now scattered at the last time at a given redshift, okay? So that's the probability here. It's normalized to one, okay? So that tells you that this is the thickness of that last scattering surface is basically the thickness of that probability here. So that also tells you that the CMB is actually a very, very <laughs> thin shell in, in, in physical distance. Because if you translate that into, by the way, for I, the peak probability here defines what we call the redshift of uh, recombination. And this is the formula for it that involves basically only the baryon density and the matter density. Okay, if you turn that into a physical distance, so that's basically one of the exercise that we proposed yesterday, is basically this is how you do it. This is Z, this is distance to large scattering surface, plus or minus that width given by the visibility function. So this is how, so you see, so this is in units of one over H naught, so this is 3.2 over here. So you measure our distance from us to that surface of large scattering, plus or minus that little width, and this is how narrow this width is. It's really small. You see, it's starting from three, so it's really a very, very thin shell around us. This is where all of the this is from this is where all of the photons scattered before they came to us. So it's really a, a thin slice of space there. Okay, so in terms of space, this is how you see this. Now, okay, so the CMB is really a, a snapshot of the sorry. Oh, I don't want to show this figure yet. So the CMB is really a snapshot of what's happening there. Ah, okay, snapshot. All right. So basically, those photons, they have traveled all the way from there to us here, and then we see them today. Okay, so they give us a slice of the initial conditions at some time in this thin shell over here. And then we see the CMB. By the way, we look at that in all directions, and we see basically the same temperature within, with small order 10 to the minus 4 fluctuations in temperature. This is the realm of Cotta's talk here. And of course, with those initial conditions, we evolved to have the structures that we see today. So this is how we have to look at this problem. We have to evolve those initial conditions and find something that looks like the universe we see today. So uh, I'm going to jump over this simulation here because it's really uh, too much for now. So this is a cosmic microwave background small fluctuations, and then you form structure from there. Now, let's go to something, hey. Okay, so 
what we see in the CMB here, how we represent it, is through we see what we see is really uh, a spherical shell. We see something on the sphere. We don't see something in the volume, which is what we need for the for, to do large scale structure. So this is how we see the CMB maps from Kobe from WMAP, and then later from uh, from Planck, which has done which has performed the the basically the ultimate map of the CMB temperature at least that we know of. Um, will probably be corrected only uh, very uh, min uh, in minor points uh, later. Okay, so this is Planck here. I don't want to say too many things that, I don't want to steal too many of the thunder from Cora. So this is WMAP, what we had 10 years ago. So this is Planck, latest figure of the map there. And that's a cosmetic figure, of course, because they have taken out the galaxy from here. Now, what I want to say is that, uh, again, this picture, oh my God, this takes a lot. <laughs> All right, so what we do here is that we decompose those, de uh, those fluctuations of temperature into multiples, and we represent the angular pulse spectrum here in terms of these CLs. This is, CL is basically the same thing as P of K. P of K is 3D, CL is 2D, all right? And then the two, but the two are related, of course. The CLs, they give us an idea of what the P of K has to be around that epoch. So that's how we know what the P of K initially has to be, right? It's through those CLs. So basically, uh, the Fourier transforms and spherical harmonics are basically two, two sides of the same thing. Fourier transforms just give you the modes in 3D space. The harmonic uh, transform gives you the mode in the 2D sphere spherical space. Uh, so uh, a function of, let's say, in two dimensions, uh, or uh, in this case or in that case, uh, you can decompose into Fourier modes like this or harmonic modes like that. That's basically the idea. Of course, these can all be related in the end, okay? So you can write this in terms of the modes in free space or the modes in harmonic space. And then you can express a power spectrum in free space or a power spectrum in harmonic space in this way. Okay, uh, and this is the power spectrum from, of the CMB as measured by Planck, and this is basically the story that you're gonna see here. All right, so the question now is this. Uh, this is what I wanna answer. I don't wanna give you a neat formula that can transform the CLs of the temperature into the P of K. This is actually much more complicated than it sounds. But we see here a bunch of data points and some theory here. And you, what you see here are these peaks there. And what I want to tell you is how these peaks arise both on the CMB and on matter. OK? All right. So what is the physics of these pressure waves? So what we have there during the recombination is that we have, as Cora told you, uh, kind of a coupling between radiation and baryons that is also living in a, in a place where, in places where you have the potential wells of dark matter, right? So you have both, so the, 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 the radiation, in a hot region, radiation is trying to get out of there, moving out of there, and it drags photon, uh, baryons out of there, there also. Uh, when, it, when that region then becomes under dense, things want to fall there. So you have a competi competition between the gravity and the pressure of the radiation at that time. So this is a system which is not really well described by those genes equations that I gave you before, but it's really more like sound waves that are driven by a gravitational potential. So one of the ways that you can see this is that if you have some initial uh, region here, suppose, so this is time here. As time evolves, you can look at these regions uh, as they uh, you can imagine that uh, a certain region which is overdense will exper experiment oscillations. It will compress, then it's too hot, then uh, pressure kicks in and, uh, and this thing expands, and then it compresses again and expands again. So this, this is happening all the time on different scales in the universe. And then you have maximum compression, maximum decompression, and so on and so forth, until, let's say, the uh, decoupling happens very quickly at some point, right? On different scales, this is happening on different times, all right? So if you look at large, at different, uh, at different little spheres there, corresponding to different scales, right? So this is K here. These compressions and the compressions are happening uh, on different time scales. So when you freeze this here, uh, this moment, what you're going to find is that uh, some scales have experimented no compression decompression oscillations. Some scales, they have experimented one compression, but not a decompression. Some scales have experimented several decompressions and decompressions. 
what is giving this, uh, these scales there? It's basically the time that you take for a signal to get from, uh, from the center of uh, one of these structures to outside. So it's uh, what we call the acoustic horizon. How do you see this acoustic horizon? How do you see this scale coming up here? How do you see this kind of physical scale appearing? Of course, if you have that physical scale, then this picture is clear. Okay, then you have something like these oscillations here that are harmonics of the physical scale, which is the maximum, maximum compression scale here, okay? Right, so the, what is the horizon? So the maximal region that has experimented basically one big compression since then. That's basically your scale that you should look at. Uh, in Fourier space, you'll see then harmonics of that, uh, of that, of those scales here, right? Basically through this picture here. Okay, so let me go quickly over here because it's basically, I'm talking about the same thing. So uh, these acoustic peaks are uh, re reflected not only in radiation, but in matter as well. Okay, so why is this? Is this switch, is this swiveling or? Yeah, because of the truck on the street. The truck's on the street? Yeah. Really? That's a, it's a resonance, huh? Anyway, so those are acoustic peaks there which are in radiation and matter. They appear there, so let me just show you. So that, those, that acoustic scale is reflected in matter, but it's harder to see if you just look at the map, at the distribution. Just like it's hard to see on the map of the CMB, it's hard to see the acoustic scale there. You really have to have a trained eye to see it, right? It is there somehow, okay? But it's not really easy to see by eye, okay? So even if you have a, uh, a nice little picture like this that, uh, that we have there, there is this acoustic scale there, but you, you are not necessarily able to see. Okay, so this is where I, could, I wanted to get at. Uh, so I'll just, just be about 15 minutes late this time. So this is an excellent, excellent movie that was done by uh, Daniel Eisenstein. It's also available here on this link here on YouTube and many other places. This is... Um, this is um, representation of one single overdensity peak here in the middle of the background. So it's background over here everywhere, and here there's a peak of density, okay? Now, when you have a density peak, you expect, at least initially, if you have any, if you have what we call adiabatic initial conditions, you expect to see the same overdensity in dark matter, in barons, in neutrinos, in photons, in everything. Okay? So suppose that you have a bad, this is how you should think of it. Suppose that you have perfectly homogeneous uh, space here, and you have a initial conditions somehow produce a little region here, like a bag, where you crunched, where you crammed a bunch of uh, many more particles of dark matter, baryons, neutrinos, photons, everything in there. Okay? So it's denser, hotter, uh, has more pressure and everything than the rest. Then you evolve that in time now. What is, it, what is going to happen? Before I do this, try to think. What do you expect is going to happen? Okay? Think in terms of the following. First of all, dark matter. If you put dark matter in some initial condition there, what is it going to feel? How it's going to behave? Now, do the same exercise for baryons, for photons. Remember that up to the time of decoupling, baryons and photons are coupled. Remember also the neutrinos are an important piece there, okay? Not really super dominant or anything, but they are an important piece. And also they behave in a particular way. Neutrinos really don't, they don't interact with anything, right? So try to think about what is going to happen with this bag here as we re start the time evolution, okay? I'm sure that many of you saw this, these movies before, but in any case, I'm just for the, those of you that haven't, really th try to think, try to imagine what's going to happen. And then I'm going to run the film now, okay? And then I'm going to run the film again with some explanation, and I'm going to show you how a certain scale shows up, okay? So here we go. So this is time here. This is redshift. So let me stop the movie over here, okay? So. We are still way before the time of recombination. What is happening here? Of course, this is just the fact that the peak is going up like crazy and I have to cut it off, otherwise I can't represent it, right? But look at what happened with neutrinos, that's easy. Neutrinos don't care about anything. You just put them in a bag, you open the bag. Of course, the bag has to be really special to keep neutrinos in. But you open the bag and neutrinos just go. 
they free stream. Now, they free stream in all directions. So the very edge of this distribution here is really going like the speed of light. But the distribution itself is really spreading like one third of c squared, actually one over root of three of the speed of light, right? Because it's equidistribution of, of, um, of velocities in here, right? Now, look what happened with the barons and the photons. Now, why is this happening? Can anybody tell me why this is happening? What is going on in here? Why do I see such a thing? Why do I see a peak here and then a trough and then a boundary and then this is like, what is going on in here? What is going on? Huh? This is not really an oscillation because we don't have like uh, many scales going on. This is a single system. This is all in real space, right? We're not really here talking about an oscillation. This is a very special configuration. We're just talking about a physical process that is simpler than a system with many degrees of freedom in oscillations and so on. Think about baryons and photons. Photons have pressure. Baryons don't have pressure, but they are non relativistic. They are heavy. You also have the dark matter. So there are many things going on. Right now, let's see what's going on before we move on. What is going on in here? Why do we have, let's start easy. Why do we have a peak here in the middle? Because of gravity. And gravity is pretty much dominated by dark matter. Dark matter doesn't care about anything. It's just going to concentrate and concentrate and concentrate that in the middle, creating a huge gravitational well. And that gravitational well is both keeping the, trying to keep the baryons inside there. Even some photons, they, they're kind of bound in there by this. By, they are affected by this gravitational well. Now, the photons, on the other hand, why is it that they couldn't behave like neutrinos? Aren't both of them relativistic? So why isn't, it the, why isn't it that the photons are just going away like neutrinos? What's happening? Why they are not going away? Because they are coupled to baryons. And baryons are cold. So the baryon photon interactions, Thomson scattering, is preventing the photons from just going out of there. So it's keeping the photons bounded. So this is what we call the acoustic horizon here. This is the acoustic horizon. The photons, even if you kept them inside there, they want to escape, but they are hitting baryons all the time. They, are hitting, they want to go, but they are hitting baryons all the time. So they are bound by some maximum distance that they can travel. And if you start this very early in the history of the universe, at redshift, I don't know, 50, 100,000, even if you wait up to a redshift of 1,000 or so, there is only so much that these photons can travel. This Horizon, this maximum distance, is called the sound horizon. And they cannot go because they are tightly coupled to the baryons. And the baryons are cold. So they are stuck in there. And they are coupled together. You see that the, the shape of this and that is pretty much the same. Even though at this time here, photons are really a small part of the fraction of density of the universe. OK? So that's why the, the coupling. Now let's go. Let's keep going here. Now, look what's going to happen at a redshift of around 1,000. Now, now. Huh? So this is, recombination is ending now. Photons are starting to decouple. So what's happening here? The baryons at this time here, you see they were both pulled out, pulled inside by the dark matter, and they were pushed outside by the photons. Two things, they're being pulled and pushed. It's like... Competition there. The photons now, now they have just become unstuck from the baryons. So they're not bound with the baryons anymore. The baryons, they have recombined. You have neutral atoms. They're not interacting with the photons anymore. The universe becomes transparent. And if the photon is moving anywhere, it's like, OK, I'm free finally. And then it goes away. And then this region here starts to behave more like neutrinos. And it free streams out of those potential wells because they are typically not dense enough to really do anything for the photons. OK? Right? So now we're talking about a redshift of, say, 200. So what happened here is that because of this push and pull of the baryons, push being pulled to the inside of that gravitational well by the dark matter and be pushed outside by the photons, they have developed this kind of kink. If you look at this on profile, it's really something like 
really something like this, right? <laughs> Not really like this, but it's kind of like this. Right? It's really a distribution which on profile looks like this. OK? So now what's happening is that we have a complicated situation where the initial conditions of dark matter and baryons in here, they are different. The profiles are different in these two cases. The photons are not relevant anymore. They just disappeared. We only detect them much later in the CMB and so on. Dark matter and baryons, they are very different. They are in different places. Phys I mean, they are spatially segregated. But they are both gravitating. Of course, baryons, they fall into dark matter, but dark matter also fills baryons. Baryons are not re relevant. They're still 20% compared to dark matter. So what you start to see here, if you notice, there's a little bump here in the, in the dark matter. That's dark matter starting to feel the gravity of the baryons, especially this kink here from the baryons. So they are both trying to interact with each other and come to an equilibrium here. So you kind of have a kind of a virialization going on now. Okay? So if you keep going now, this virialization is going to equilibrate dark matter and baryons so that baryons become less uh, that, that, that kink becomes less pronounced in baryons and becomes more pronounced in dark matter. So that, look at this time now, they're almost the same. If you look at actually the correlation function now, they're, it's not exactly the same, but similar. Okay? They're almost the same now. But look at redshift, say, I don't know, 13 or so. So if you probe in the universe, at with uh, 21 centimeters, for instance, at very high redshifts, the uh, the correlation function. What this tells you is that the correlation function of dark matter and baryons is significantly different, especially on the scales of the baryon acoustic oscillations. Okay, of this acoustic horizon. But if you look at later times, especially at low redshifts, redshifts below, let's say five or three or so on, then these two are pretty much the same. The profiles are the same. Okay. So that scale, OK, so remember, this is just for a single bag of density here. The universe is much more complicated than this. It has all kinds of things superimposed. It have nothing which is as well behaved as this, OK? So if you look at this uh, scale in the distribution of matter, you see that basically the same feature is in dark matter and in baryons. So if you measure baryons, you're measuring really the feature of dark matter. So that's a really convenient thing, right? So if you look now at the, OK? So anybody want me to run this movie all over again? By the way, uh, the, on the, on, I'll, I'll make these slides available online. Uh, and uh, you can just click there. But it's really, uh, most people should be familiar. So here again is the whole evolution for you to see. Now recombination is going, uh, decoupling is going to start happening now. So they go away. The feature is there. Now, dark matter is going to start filling the baryons over here. They start to going to be, uh, develop a little kink over there. There you go. The kink is starting to form. Baryons are starting to equilibrate with dark matter. They are becoming more and more like each other, such that today they are pretty much the same. OK, so that's the sound horizon, acoustic horizon. That's in the initial conditions. OK, so whatever we've done here, this is. Uh, what we, the calculations we did here today, they are kind of orthogonal to this. We have some initial conditions uh, which have this acoustic scale. It's, this acoustic scale is going to be there later on. It's just going to be more pronounced, right? So let me show you what it happens here. So this is a profile. Let me go actually uh, further here. Okay. I have a calculation here for the acoustic horizon, but uh, this is what I wanted to show you. So this is a correlation function multiplied by R squared here, okay? So this really has interpretation now of probability. Now, again, this is the same thing. Uh, so the evolution of this correlation function with time. So that's uh, basically correlation function in, in space. So up until recombination. So this, again, neutrinos, baryons and photons really coupled. And they are one on top of each other. And dark matter is over here, OK? So basically, dark matter is over here. This is very similar to what you're going to get from, um, from, uh, from inflation, by the way. Uh, and now, 
recombination is going to start to happen now. Okay? So this is recombination over here. Now the photons, which are here in dashed blue, and the baryons, which are in brown, they start to move away from each other. So you have this feature, that feature here, which is the acoustic horizon is imprinted in this bump here. That feature is going to now be enhanced. Uh, and uh, it's going to start to, you, you, that feature is going to start to pull in the dark matter. So that feature is going to start appearing also in the correlation function of dark matter as well. So that at low redshifts, that correlation function has that feature there also, right? So as we get to five or three or one or so, then these two are pretty much the same. Okay? So this is how the scale arises. And this is one of the things that we want to measure. It comes from the CMB. It's a simple thing. And uh, now I told you pretty much all that you need to know about uh, linear perturbations uh, and evolution of the correlation function in power spectrum. OK? I think I'm going to stop here because I'm already late again. Thank you. Let's leave questions for later on because I'm already way ahead of time, way past the time that I should be. So questions in the afternoon, OK? Actually, today there's a colloquium, right? Yeah. There's no, OK. You can ask me questions anytime later in coffee or later. I don't know if there's a, is there a discussion session today? I don't, I don't recall the program. Oh, there's a presentation, yeah. É que R ao quadrado, R ao quadrado ali que está fazendo alguma coisa, viu? O, o pico dele está de fato aumentando, mas eu não... Opa, deixa eu desligar aqui. É, o R ao quadrado está fazendo...